It was a good day for a parade, sunny and unseasonably warm, the sky a Sunday school carton of heaven. Not too long ago, people would have felt the need to make a nervous crack about weather like this. Hey, they'd say, maybe this global warming isn't such a bad thing after all. But these days, no one bothered much about the hole in the ozone layer or the pathos of a world without polar bears. It seemed almost funny in retrospect, all that energy wasted fretting about something so remote and uncertain, an ecological disaster that might or might not come to pass somewhere way off in the distant future. Long after you and your children and your children's children had lived out your allotted time on Earth and gone to wherever it was you went when it was all over. Despite the anxiety that had dogged him all morning, Mayor Kevin Garvey found himself gripped by an unexpected mood of nostalgia as he walked down Washington Avenue toward the high school parking lot where the marchers had been told to assemble. It was half an hour before showtime, the floats lined up and ready to roll, the marching band girding itself for battle, peppering the air with a discordant overture of bleats and toots and half-hearted drum rolls. Kevin had been born and raised in Mapleton, and he couldn't help thinking about Fourth of July parades back when everything still made sense. Half the town lined up along Main Street, while the other half, little leaguers, scouts of both genders, gimpy veterans of foreign wars trailed by the ladies' auxiliary, strode down the middle of the road, waving to the spectators as if surprised to see them there, as if this were some kind of kooky coincidence rather than a national holiday. In Kevin's memory, at least, it all seemed impossibly loud and hectic and innocent. Fire trucks, tubas, Irish step dancers, baton twirlers in sequined costumes. One year, even a squadron of fez bedecked Shriners scooting around in those hilarious midget cars. Afterward, there were softball games and cookouts, a sequence of comforting rituals culminating in the big fireworks display over Fielding Lake. Hundreds of rapt faces turned skyward, ooing and wowing at the sizzling pinwheels and slow-blooming starbursts that lit up the darkness, reminding everyone of who they were and where they belonged and why it was all good. Today's event, the first annual Departed Heroes Day of Remembrance and Reflection, to be precise, wasn't going to be anything like that. Kevin could sense the somber mood as soon as he arrived at the high school, an invisible haze of stale grief and chronic bewilderment thickening the air, causing people to talk more softly and move more tentatively than they normally would at a big outdoor gathering. On the other hand, he was both surprised and gratified by the turnout, given the cool reception the parade had received when it was first proposed. Some critics thought the timing was wrong, too soon, they'd insisted, while others suggested that a secular commemoration of October 14th was wrongheaded and possibly blasphemous. These objections had faded over time, either because the organizers had done a good job winning over the skeptics or because people just generally liked to parade, regardless of the occasion. In any case, so many Mapletonians had volunteered to march that Kevin wondered if there'd be anyone left to cheer them on from the sidelines as they made their way through the center of town to Greenway Park. He hesitated for a moment just inside the line of police barricades, marshalling his strength for what he knew would be a long and difficult day. Everywhere he looked, he saw broken people and fresh reminders of suffering. He waved to Martha Reeder, the once chatty lady who worked the stamp window at the post office, She smiled sadly, turning to give him a better look at the homemade sign she was holding. It featured a poster-sized photograph of her three-year-old granddaughter, a serious child with curly hair and slightly crooked eyeglasses. Ashley, it said, my little angel. Standing beside her was Stan Washburn, a retired cop and former Pop Warner coach of Kevin's, a squat, no-neck guy whose T-shirt stretched tight over an impressive beer gut invited anyone who cared to ask me about my brother. Kevin felt a sudden powerful urge to flee, to run home and spend the afternoon lifting weights or raking leaves. Anything solitary and mindless would do, but it passed quickly like a hiccup or a shameful sexual fantasy. Expelling a soft, dutiful sigh, he waded into the crowd, shaking hands and calling out names, doing his best impersonation of a small-town politician, a role he hadn't sought and that still didn't come naturally to him. An ex-Mapleton High football star and prominent local businessman, he'd inherited and expanded his family's chain of supermarket-sized liquor stores, tripling the revenue during his 15-year tenure. 
He was a popular and highly visible figure around town, but the idea of running for office had never crossed his mind. Then, just last year, out of the blue, he was presented with a petition signed by 200 fellow citizens, many of whom he knew well. We, the undersigned, are desperate for leadership in these dark times. Will you help us take back our town? Touched by this appeal and feeling a bit lost himself, he'd sold the business for a small fortune a few months earlier and still hadn't figured out what to do next. He accepted the mayoral nomination of a newly formed political entity called the Hopeful Party. <laughs>